Texas International Payment Terms. Today's webinar is the second in a five-part series and will focus on the intricacies of getting paid. For the benefit of our listeners, my name is Katie Henry, and I'm the Executive Director of the Metro Milwaukee Association of Commerce World Trade Association. That is a mouthful. The <laughs> World Trade Association is the state's largest network of manufacturers and service providers involved in international business. Our members benefit from regular educational programming with subject matter experts and networking opportunities. More information about the WTA can be found on our website at mmac.org backslash WTA.html. In just a moment, I'm going to turn the webinar over to our presenter, Paul Eversman, Vice President, Foreign Exchange and Trade Finance Associated Bank. The first is some housekeeping. Please be sure to mute your phones. Please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Use the chat box at the right of the screen to input a question. I will be monitoring those and I will try to ask them for you. Paul's contact information will also be provided to everyone at the end of the presentation. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objection, you may disconnect at this time. Everyone will be given a link to view the presentation after the webinar. It will be included in your evaluation email. Now, I'd like to introduce Paul Eversman. Paul is Vice President, Foreign Exchange and Trade Finance, Associated Bank. Paul is responsible for developing foreign exchange and trade service solutions for Associated Bank's clients in the Midwest. He brings over 35 years of experience to Associated's client base. Paul served in the U.S. Army Security Agency as a German linguist and intelligence analyst in Berlin in the 70s. He attended International Banking Summer School at St. John's College, Cambridge University in 1985. And before joining Associated in 2001, he managed correspondent relations with banks in Canada, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. He earned a BA in German and an MBA MBA in finance from Indiana University. He is active in the Milwaukee World Trade Association, Madison International Trade Association, and the International Credit Executives Group. Paul, I'd like to turn it over to you to start out. Thank you, Katie, and thank you to all the listeners who tuned in for today's presentation. Uh, this is going to be kind of a high-level overview of international payment terms. We don't have time in one hour to drill down too deeply into uh, how to use letters of credit, for example. We'll cover those, again, from a high level. Um, I should say also that as we talk about payment terms, they obviously have implications for both buyers and sellers. This presentation is being given mainly from the perspective of sellers. Uh, I'll try to remember as I go through these things to, to comment on the, sort of the buyer's perspective as well. Um, but mainly this is oriented toward uh, U.S. Wisconsin companies as exporters. So first of all, let's look at some of the uh, risks in international trade. You'll be familiar with all of these. Commercial risk, country or political risk, exchange rate risk, uh, and both parties are exposed to these risks, uh, buyers and sellers. Um, let's take a, a look at each one of them in turn. Commercial risk, obviously, is just the, the risk that one party or the other does not live up to the terms of the contract. Either the seller fails to deliver the goods uh, as ordered by the buyer in accordance with the contract, or the buyer fails to take delivery of the goods uh, or to pay for them in accordance with uh, the contract. Country and political risk, this can be anything as severe as war, insurrection, civil commotion, it can be uh, just banking system instability. It can be actions of the U.S. government, as we see uh, sanctions being imposed on foreign uh, governments, uh, foreign individuals, oligarchs, you name it, around the country for various reasons. Any of these things can come up at any time and impede the progress of a transaction. Exchange rate risk exists in every cross-border transaction. Uh, buyers and sellers have it either directly or indirectly. That is to say, if you're dealing in your own currency, 
uh, you have the, the exchange rate risk indirectly because you are relying on the other party to, to deal with, uh, with, with the exchange rate risk directly. Um, if you're dealing in, in, in pounds or, or euros and you know you have the exchange rate risk, uh, that is the direct risk. You have to accommodate that somehow. If you are in dealing in U.S. dollars, um, you have the risk indirectly because you're, you're forcing the other party to, to deal with it directly, and that party will do it in, in different ways. Um, if you're a buyer of goods, you may be paying more because the, buy, the seller is marking his prices up more to accommodate the possibility of exchange rate fluctuations. If you're selling goods overseas, um, you might miss the fact that the U.S. dollar becomes more costly, uh, appreciates in value, making your goods more expensive than they would otherwise be, even though you haven't changed your prices. So those kinds of risks uh, play into our choice of payment terms, whether we're a buyer or a seller. Other kinds of considerations, and these are the questions that I always ask uh, companies when we talk about payment terms, is what kind of product are we talking about? Uh, is, it, um, is it specialized? Is it, finished, is it finished goods? Is it a raw material? Is it perishable or time sensitive or custom built? Um, is, it, uh, is it a high value item? Uh, I can conceive of transactions with very small medical instruments. Um, you know, a box bigger than a shoe, no bigger than a shoe box might have $10,000 worth of product in it. Um, is this a one off transaction? Uh, it, will there be continuous demand, or is it a one-time sale of capital goods, for example? Um, type of customer, or by the same token, type of supplier, if you're the buyer. Is it a big, well-financed company that we, we know well with, has credit ratings that we can evaluate, and we'd be confident that the party will, um, will abide with its, its obligations on the contract? If it's, if it's a, a customer we're selling to, is it a repeat customer? Is it a one-off transaction? Um, how, how badly does our customer need our product? How much control does that give us or leverage over the, the payment terms? And the type of market. Is there a lot of competition? Do we pretty much own the market, in which case we can get what we, what we demand? Uh, are alternatives readily available? What are the customary payment terms in the industry? Uh, we can't get what, what others will, uh, uh, will, are not demanding. A word about INCO terms. Uh, uh, the last seminar last month was on INCO terms given by CECO Logistics. Uh, I just want to say a word about INCO terms because they are critical to every um, every international transaction. In fact, it's not even possible to hold a meaningful international price without an INCO term and a place. There are 11 INCO terms. The one that new exporters always gravitate to is X Works. Uh, I wish they wouldn't do that. I'd kind of like you to just forget about it um, and uh, rely on the other info terms. Some of these, as you can see, work with any mode of transportation. Some of them are restricted to marine mode of transportation, which could be a, a barge or a boat, an ocean vessel, et cetera. Uh, but I, I bring these up because some of these info terms work better than others uh, with particular times of, types of payment transactions. So we're going to go through this chart a couple of times. I'll throw it up every time uh, we, we change to a new payment mode just to put it in perspective for you. But you can see that it is a, it's a continuum. It's a spectrum, if you will. Um, cash advance, obviously, is the benefit of the seller. Open account, obviously, benefits the, the buyer. Uh, we're going to try to get through these and then spend a little more time on the ones in the middle. Paul, Paul yeah. this is Katie. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I see we had a few more people join. Um, I just want to remind everybody to please mute your phones because we're getting a little bit of um, some background noise. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so cash advance. I apologize for the pedantic approach I'm going to take, but I'm going to basically with each of these say what is it, how do you use it, and what are the advantages and disadvantages. Cash in advance uh, is kind of obvious. Uh, the, the buyer is sending funds before the seller ships the goods. Uh, so that is entirely in the favor of the seller. There are two ways to do this, wire transfer or uh, if you're the U.S. seller, a check drawn on a, on a U.S. bank. And we want to be careful if we're accepting checks um, because those are not necessarily definitive payments and we want to be careful that we're getting exactly what we're asking for and don't expose ourselves to any additional risk by accepting a written payment instrument. 
uh, and particularly if you're the seller of goods and you request a wire transfer and you get some sort of a check or draft or other paper instrument instead, be very careful. That's a big red flag. You might be, uh, be set up for fraud. When do we use cash in advance? Um, in each of these cases, when I say when to use, uh, some or all of these criteria may apply. Uh, and um, it's a little bit of a mix and match arrangement. We don't have to check all these boxes, but these are some of the kinds of considerations that we want to take into account if we consider using cash in advance. If it's a first time sale um, or a one time sale to an unfamiliar buyer that you can't otherwise get good credit information on or who, whose credit does not appear strong, cash advance is a good, a good way to go. If it's a smaller dollar transaction, it's more likely to, to work with cash in advance. Uh, the buyer is likely to object less, perhaps, than if it were a large amount of money. Uh, if you're selling to a strong buyer in a weak country, um, you might want to get cash in advance because the, the buyer's ability to, to get U.S. dollars to pay you after you ship might otherwise be a risk for you. Uh, and last but not least, I, I always like getting at least some cash up front if, if it's possible. Kind of uh, uh, gets the, the buyer committed to the transaction. So, again, why is it, why is it great? No risk to the seller, obviously. Um, you can use those funds you receive before shipment to as working capital to buy inputs, components, uh, prepare uh, the shipment, and uh, it is it is cheap. There's low cost to, to both parties to handle wire transfer. However, other things that come to bear are the buyer obviously is bearing the whole cost of the financing uh, and is also taking the risk of not receiving the goods. If, if you were my customer at, uh, uh, on the buying side of this equation, I would be cautioning you about these things. Uh, cash in advance may not be competitive. If other competitors, other providers of your product or competitive product are giving open terms or other less restrictive terms than, open, than cash in advance, you might be at a competitive disadvantage. In some countries uh, that have uh, less access to foreign exchange, hard currency, U.S. dollars, euros, pounds, et cetera, the dozen or so uh, currencies that, that are, are global currencies that, uh, that, we, that company, countries keep their reserves in, um, uh, some countries don't have access to those or because they don't export enough, they, they, they don't have enough um, dollars, pounds, euros in the bank themselves. So it may be hard for your customer to get the dollars to pay you. And uh, consequently, cash in advance uh, may be prohibited or restricted because the, the buyer's country is trying to keep dollars from going out of the country uh, before any product comes in. Uh, there's, a, there's a regulatory, ex, uh, an export compliance regulation risk here of, of goods being diverted. Um, and I say that here because it's too easy for a U.S. company to, to get an order. The buyer uh, offers to pay cash in advance by wire transfer. Uh, you say that's great. Uh, the, the seller agrees to INCO terms that I would not necessarily advise. Um, but the seller is trying to take as little, uh, take on as little responsibility as possible for the transaction. There's a risk in, in that context of the goods being diverted to a destination uh, where they shouldn't go, where the U.S. government has said maybe you can't do business, uh, where your goods are not allowed to go, and uh, cash in advance is, is sort of part of that. Uh, kind of a transaction where you might be setting yourself up for those risks just because you're you're trying to kind of divorce yourself from all the responsibility for the transaction. Um, the last two things I, I, I mentioned because uh, we're seeing increasing fraud in banking, uh, hardly a, a, a day or a week goes by that we don't have fraud. Uh, I would suggest that you not give away your main operating bank account number um, with your wire transfer instructions. Uh, as a kind of a best practice, I recommend setting up a separate account, uh, which you use only for incoming wire transfers. That then is the account number you give out with your wire transfer instructions. It's just an empty bucket that money comes into from time to time. When money comes in, then you transfer it to your main account, but you don't use a sweep or anything like that because you don't want to expose your operating account to, um, to the potential for, for fraud. Uh, the last thing is also fraud related. Be careful how you convey wire transfer instructions. Uh, we're all used to using email. It's simple, it's easy, but we're seeing a lot of fraud nowadays with um, around 
emailed wire transfer instructions. Um, it is easy for hackers to break into your or your customers or your supplier's um, email address books and uh, concoct a new email that looks exactly like it came from you or from them, logos, fonts, everything, and um, change wire transfer instructions. So it might be it might be your customer getting an email that purports to be from you saying, hey, we just changed banks, henceforth use these new wire transfer instructions, and your money goes someplace else. Now, uh, whether you were hacked or they were hacked is, is something for the tech, technicians and the lawyers to sort out, but be careful how you convey those wire transfer instructions. Uh, have that conversation with your counterparties that you're exchanging funds with, suppliers, customers, et cetera. And as a best practice, it's probably a good idea to confirm any change in wire transfer instructions by phone, uh, even if somebody has to get up in the middle of the night to do that. Okay, open account. We're taking open account and cash in advance together because they are basically just, just a payment, nothing complicated about it, just a wire transfer with open account. You now were on the other end of the spectrum. The seller is shipping goods and sending the documents, controlling that shipment directly to the buyer uh, with the expectation that the buyer is going to pay for the goods in the uh, agreed terms uh, in accordance with the invoice by either a wire transfer or a draft or a check. Again, as always, a wire transfer is preferable. So when would you use this? Again, some of the things that might apply, um, it's a well-established customer, might be an affiliate of your company, might be a subsidiary, um, buyer has an excellent credit standing, country political risk are low, uh, if it's a first-time sale to uh, maybe even an unknown buyer, if it's a small amount of money, you might be prepared to take that business risk. Um, if it is um, a larger amount of money and or you're extending these terms on a, on a regular basis, continuing basis, then uh, for your own risk of mit uh, mitigation purposes, you might choose to support those receivables with credit insurance, something we'll talk about a little bit uh, later on. Advantages of open account, again, are obvious. Uh, only the buyer and the seller are involved. Documentation is simple. It may be insured from the seller standpoint with credit insurance, and there's low cost to both parties. However, other things to keep in mind. Uh, the seller in this case is bearing all the risk, right? All the commercial risk, the country risk, there are no third parties involved to help in the event of a dispute. It's just you against the, 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 the seller or the buyer, depending on your transaction. Um, have to go to court to sort it out on the basis of your sales contract. The seller is bearing all the cost of financing the transaction. You're waiting for your money. Um, in case of non-payment, the, uh, the seller has to prove that a transaction occurred. Got to come up with documents uh, to show that there was a that there is a debt owed because there there is no promissory instrument of any kind. So what would those documents be? If you want to sue to get your money back, it has to be an order from the buyer. Uh, you have to have an invoice you've issued with payment terms, etc., and um, a transport document showing that you shipped the goods. And those things have to sort of match up with one another. Now I'm not a lawyer. That's not legal advice, but but that's basically what's going to be behind proving that a debt exists. As we said, open account can be supported by credit insurance or by standby letter of credit, something we'll comment again on briefly later. And once more, be careful with uh, your, your wire transfer instructions and um, the, the bank account number that you, that you uh, give to the whole world and everybody who's listening. Okay, so back to our payment terms chart again. We're moving on now. We've covered open account, cash advance, those two bookends that are just basically a payment, just a simple wire transfer. And now we're going to cover the ground in the middle, letters of credit, documentary collections. These are what we call uh, documentary payment terms, sometimes referred to as secure payment terms, although you know qualified, uh, so they are secure to a greater or lesser extent. But the idea is that with these payment terms, we're trying to keep some control over the goods until we get paid. Uh, maybe we've already gone through cash in advance. Maybe we've made a couple of sales to our foreign customer. Maybe our, our business volume has grown, and the buyer is saying, hey, I can't be your bank forever. Um, I can't keep paying you cash in advance for everything I buy from you. We've got to come up with something else. He may ask for open account, or the buyer may ask for open account. Uh, but first, we want to kind of go through these, these terms in the middle, particularly if you're the seller. You probably want to counter with something like, well, let's talk about maybe a letter of credit, again, depending on the amount of money involved. 
But the, the key to these kinds of documents, the these payments, is uh, the transport document, the main transport document, which for our purposes is, is the, the transport document that is carrying your goods over water, typically, so by air or by ocean, but somewhere over uh, across an ocean. That's our main transport document. It's not a truck bill of lading. It's, it's the document that's going to get our goods to the foreign country. So, what is a letter of credit? Commercial letter of credit in this case, we're talking about any letter of credit is a promise of payment to the beneficiary, who in this case is going to be the buyer of goods, uh, by the buyer's bank. I beg your pardon, the promise of payment is to the, the beneficiary is the seller uh, made by the buyer's bank on behalf of the buyer, uh, provided that specified conditions are met on the face of documents that the beneficiary must present to claim the payment. So the commercial letter of credit, what we want to do is reflect the terms of the sales contract so that it's clear that if the seller has presented documents that evidence compliance with the letter of credit, that means the seller has complied with the sales contract as in, and is entitled to the, uh, to the buyer's money. That's, that's the idea. When do we want to use this? Uh, as I said, it might be when we've already uh, we've, uh, um, gone through, we've got as much cash in advance as we can get. Uh, it may be that a letter of credit is required due to regulations in the buyer's country. It might be because, as I said earlier, that the, the buyer's country has restrictions on access to hard currency, U.S. dollars. Um, if the buyer is a poor credit risk or an unknown credit risk uh, and you can't get cash in advance, this is sort of uh, plan B. Uh, if the goods are customized, perishable, time-sensitive, and you might otherwise have considered offering uh, more lenient terms, like open account or something like that, uh, this is where we might want to have a little bit more secure transaction, again, depending on uh, the, the buyer, the characteristics of the buyer. It might be a larger dollar value. It might be something that uh, where we've, we've extended open account terms to the buyer in the past. We've got now as much open account credit exposure as we think we can stand or our insurer, credit insurer, will cover, and maybe we have to look for some other way to get the next transaction done. Business is booming, the buyer is taking a lot of your product, uh, but there's a lot of money outstanding, and we have to sort of work our way back across the spectrum of payment terms to something a little bit more secure. So again, my point is that, that these, these different payment terms can be sort of mixed and matched. It's not always all of one or all of the other Depending on circumstances, we might be moving back and forth across that, that scale of payment terms. Advantages of using a commercial letter of credit, uh, there, are, there is some protection for both parties here because there, there are banks in the middle um, monitoring the transaction, obviously. Um, there are some buyers who could get open account terms from their suppliers who choose to use um, uh, letters of credit from the buying side because uh, of the protection it gives them that the, the seller has to present documents that evidence compliance with the sales contract. And, and if those documents are not compliant, it's the bank who's saying you're not getting paid. It's not the buyer getting stuck with goods that, um, that don't comply with a sales contract and an invoice and, that, and a dispute that they have to resolve. The banks are in the middle of that transaction. Uh, with a commercial letter of credit or any letter of credit, it cannot be uh, amended without the agreement of all the parties to the letter of credit, the banks, the buyer, and the seller, all the parties. So other considerations, commercial letters of credit, any letter of credit requires strict compliance with the terms. This is where we say the devil is in the detail, I's must be dotted, T's must be crossed, uh, and that is because the banks involved are not specialists in your product, in your business. Uh, the banks do not know whether a hyphen is, in, is important um, in, in, in describing the goods or not. Um, a fellow who does a lot of training on, on letters of credit gives the example uh, because he grew up in Colorado on a farm. Uh, someone asked him whether cows can be 24 months pregnant. Um, and he said, no, of course not. That's silly. Well, the letter of credit that they were looking at uh, called for cows that were or, a certificate that described the cows as two to 24 months pregnant. And of course, what was missing was a hyphen, two to four months pregnant. Point is, the banks don't typically know uh, the details about the goods being shipped. In that case, he happened to know that cows can't be 24 months pregnant. The station period is much shorter. But, but that's how critical 
punctuation can be. The banks don't um, don't uh, judge these things. All they do is compare. What does the letter of credit say? What do the documents say? If there's a hyphen missing, it eh, doesn't pass inspection. So um, what we're doing with the commercial letter of credit is is that the seller is 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 transferring the risk from the buyer to the buyer's bank. So we're saying we don't know the buyer, we don't know the credit, or we don't like the credit. Let's do something to enhance that. Now we get a, a promise to pay from the buyer's bank. Uh, next question is, okay, how do we feel about that? We've got a bank a letter of credit from a bank in Greece or Venezuela. How do we feel about that? Any better? Not so much? Okay, let's see if we can get that letter of credit confirmed by a bank that we we do know and whose credit we trust. Uh, confirmation means that 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 second bank, in this case for a U.S. exporter, it will typically be a U.S. bank that we know and trust. That bank is stepping in front of the issuing bank overseas and saying, okay, don't even look at them, forget about them. Now this is my letter of credit. You present your documents to me. If you comply with the terms of the, of the letter of credit, I will pay you. I'll worry about Greece. I'll worry about Venezuela. I'll worry if that bank is going to fail. You're going to pay me a fee for that, but I'll take that risk. Now this is a letter of credit as if it were issued by the confirming bank rather than by the foreign bank. Um, but continuing, a letter of credit, if you get a letter of credit from your buyer, uh, it, it requires a credit facility, a line of credit, some sort of credit uh, extension by, by the buyer's bank to that buyer. Uh, the buyer's bank may require cash collateral. They may require some other kind of collateral, but it, it, it puts a burden on the buyer, and that's something you have to be aware of. Commercial letters of credit are relatively costly compared with other uh, methods of payment. Uh, it's always hard to say in advance what the letter of credit transaction is going to end up costing. It depends on how many banks are involved. It depends on um, uh, how the transaction proceeds and develops, whether there are changes, amendments, other kinds of things. Uh, but it's, it's often difficult to say before the fact what a letter of credit transaction will cost. Um, we often say, well, it could be you know, up to like say 2% maybe of the value of the contract. Uh, but, and, and that's probably true with a little bit larger transactions, say $50,000, $60,000 and up. If they're smaller transactions, uh, they will also often be subject to minimum fees that every bank involved will charge, and so that could add up pretty quickly. You don't necessarily, I would not advise using a commercial letter of credit for a $3,000 transaction. You might end up with you know, $500 in fees, and there goes your profit. Um, letters of credit are not necessarily ideal for uh, custom-made goods or perishable goods because of the risk of, of a discrepancy. If you get your documents wrong, You've basically lost the, the bank's promise to pay you, and, and now it reverts kind of to the buyer. Does the buyer still want the goods? Does the buyer still want to pay you? Does the buyer's bank and or the confirming bank, do they still want to pay you? Because if circumstances have changed, they might all say, no, thank you. And, uh, and you're stuck with goods that are, that are custom made, and perhaps you've, you've got some value in them, custom made or perishable. And here's, again, a reference to the INCO terms. INCO terms that start with the letter C are best. Uh, those that start with the letter D can, in many circumstances, be workable when you're using a letter, commercial letter of credit when you're the seller, uh, but take that under advisement. And um, this is the first thing I look at when someone talks to me about a letter of credit or when I am shown a letter of credit to review, the first thing I look for uh, under the field that has the description of goods is what are the INCO terms, uh, because they should ideally be a, a C term or a D term. Okay, back to our payments chart again. We're moving on to the other type of uh, documentary payment term, documentary collections. And these come in two types, um, immediate payment and, and deferred payment. <clears throat> so a documentary collection I, I sometimes describe as kind of the, the poor country cousin of the letter of credit. It works kind of the same way in that we're passing documents um, from seller's bank to the buyer's bank to collect the money. The difference is that we don't have any bank's promise to pay for those goods. The banks are just going to um, control the documents until, um, until they, they have even been paid for or the, the buyer has promised to pay for them. And uh, a little bit more detail on that in a second. So here we are. So in, in the more secure version of a documentary collection, the 
buyer has to pay immediately in order to receive the documents from his bank uh, to, to collect the goods. We want the goods with a documentary collection transaction as with a letter of credit transaction. We want our goods now to end up at a foreign port or airport, ideally, uh, behind a fence where the buyer can't get them without the shipping documents. And the key to that is, is the main transport document. It's the ocean bill of lading or it's the airway bill, uh, each of which has to be consigned in a certain way. And that goes back to the implications of INCO terms, who's handling the documents, et cetera. So with the first version of this, the more secure version, uh, the seller ships goods, gives the documents to their bank. Let's get to talk about a U.S. bank, Wisconsin bank. And uh, the U.S. bank forwards those documents to the buyer's bank or a bank in the buyer's country with an instruction letter that says you're authorized to release these attached documents to the buyer against payment or under the second version against the buyer's promise to pay. Now we call these, these uh, payment types by a couple of different names and it can be confusing. Uh, sometimes companies will say, oh, my, my customer offered to pay me on a site draft term or on a time draft or they view, they said cash against documents. What does that mean? Or, or, or DA or DP. These are all different ways to say um, immediate payment or deferred payment. So immediate payment, we call that site draft or documents against payment or cash against documents if there is no draft. Sometimes there's no draft involved in the transaction because the buyer's country imposes um, duties or levies or stamp taxes on that kind of a financial instrument and so we just do it without a draft. Um, alternatively, if the goods can be released merely against the buyer's promise to pay, we call that time draft or documents against acceptance. There has to be a draft in that case, and the draft has to be acceptance. Acceptance in this case means the, the buyer actually has to sign that draft and date it and write accepted on it. And that, by doing so, they are accepting their legal obligation to pay that draft when, it, when it's due. It's just like signing a promissory note, same thing. So when would we use this? Um, all else being equal, we would use this if the buyer has better credit, uh, if we've maybe moved, moved across the, the scale from cash and bass to commercial letter of credit, we're moving in the direction of open account, uh, documentary collection is a good place to stop in between before we go all the way to open account. Um, this makes sense where the country political risk uh, are low. If it's a first time transaction, maybe if it's a low value transaction, I would say that, so for my example, a while ago, a $3,000 transaction, uh, I would ideally suggest getting, you know, always try to get some money down, get half, get $1,500 uh, down by wire transfer and collect the other $1,500 by a documentary collection payable, you know, at site or cash against documents. So the buyer has to pay for the documents in order to get them and can't get goods without the documents. So what we've done is reduced the risk of the seller to a small amount and we've kept the transaction cost down to 150 bucks or something like that. We would also consider this where uh, we would otherwise sell to the buyer on open account, but uh, our, our customer is in Egypt, say, and we always sold to them on open account before. It's our dealer, it's our distributor, they've been our, our channel partner for a long, long time. We trust them implicitly, but Egypt doesn't have any dollars anymore or not enough to go around. So they've imposed foreign exchange controls. Now we have to, we have to find an alternative and we might use uh, documentary collection instead of that. So the general advantages of a documentary collection of either variety, uh, we're trying to control access to the goods until we have received payment or the buyer's written promise to pay. Uh, the banks are not examining the documents for compliance with with anything. With 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 there is no letter of credit, so there's nothing to check the documents against as there is with a, a letter of credit. The banks are checking the documents for regulatory compliance reasons because we all are responsible for knowing who we're doing business with. We have to know the buyer, the seller, every name that appears in the transaction, forwarder, steamship line, air freight company, vessel, every name that appears we have to check against regulatory compliance uh, databases. And we have, a, we have a duty to make sure that the transaction makes sense. If there's some aspect of it that, that looks a little iffy, uh, we have an obligation to look into it, but so that's all um, export regulatory compliance checking. We're not comparing your documents to anything else 
uh, except maybe one another again to make sure that the, the transaction makes sense. For a documentary credit, credit transaction, the buyer does not need a credit facility because nobody is promising to make payment on the buyer's behalf. It's their commercial risk still exists. Um, the the buyer could choose uh, not to ever show up and pay for the documents. Your goods are on the water or they arrived at the foreign port. The buyer could uh, disappear from the face of the earth and your goods are still at the port. You haven't lost control of them. Uh, you have a way then to work through your freight forwarder to recover them or destroy them, whatever the case may be, but you haven't lost control of them. That's that's the key to these documentary transactions. But you do still have that commercial risk um, in the one case that the buyer just doesn't uh, authorize payment, never takes control uh, uh, possession of the goods, or in the second case, if the buyer merely has to promise to pay in order to get possession of the goods, uh, there's still the risk of the buyer is unable or unwilling to pay when the draft matures. Okay, so a little bit more detail on these things. Um, site draft, documents against payment, cash against documents. This is the, the variety where the, the seller controls the goods until they're paid for. Buyer cannot get the goods without paying for them, cannot get the documents that control access to the goods without paying for them. Uh, it is a reasonable alternative to letters of credit for smaller transactions. Again, I also like to say, let's see if we can get a 50% down payment. So the advantages are uh, of, of documents against acceptance. This is with the time draft now, and we're kind of comparing this, contrasting this with open account. Um, so as I said, we don't necessarily have to go right from cash in advance to open account or even letter of credit to open account. There's a couple of little steps in between that we could do. One of them is uh, documentary collection uh, on, a, on DA terms, documents against acceptance. In this case, the buyer only has to sign that time draft in order to get the goods. That's, that's his only obligation. That's the obligation of the banks, just to make sure the buyer signs that promissory obligation. But now the buyer's bank is going to contact the buyer when that draft is coming due. Um, and it, it, it's, it's more likely to get paid, I would say, all else being equal, if the buyer has some money, but maybe not enough money to pay everything, then I think the buyer is more likely to pay those drafts when they come due because the bank is calling about them and leave open account obligations um, to wait. Okay. There's also the, the risk to the buyer under certain law in certain places that um, non-payment, failure to pay that draft could ruin the buyer's credit. That's because there's a legal process called protest uh, and if you as the seller, as the drawer of the draft, you're owed the money, if you file protest in the buyer's country, uh, that is a legal process that makes uh, public the fact that the buyer did not pay his obligation. And um, because it's public, it can dry up the buyer's credit and put him out of business. So in those cases where the, the buyer has money, but he has to choose, who do I pay? Do I pay my, my time draft because the bank is calling me, or do I pay these other open account invoices? Uh, that's something that's going to weigh heavily in favor of paying the time draft. So. Other considerations, we talked about these a little bit. Uh, you, as a seller, you have to wait until a draft is paid or accepted. Um, the, the seller, the buyer gets the goods at, at that point. There's no way to speed things up. You are bearing all of the commercial and the country or political risk of the transaction um, unless, you, unless you use credit, credit insurance to, to support this. Uh, there's no built-in financing opportunity for the time draft as, as there is under a letter of credit. Usually under letters of credit, we want to get paid as shippers. We want to get paid immediately as soon as our documents are approved. But it's also possible to build in deferred payment terms. And, um, and in the context of a letter of credit, that provides a financing opportunity for the buyer. The buyer doesn't have to pay immediately. Uh, it's all built into the letter of credit transaction. That doesn't exist with, with a uh, documentary collection because neither neither bank, no bank in the transaction is taking any credit exposure on the documentary collection. Um, again, like letter of credit, this is not risk-free for custom-made or perishable goods. Uh, again, because of, you're not in control of the time factor, the buyer may in fact not decide to take delivery of the goods after all or take possession of them, may not, uh, may not uh, pay for them. And uh, as with letters of credit though, INCO terms that start with letter C are ideal. They give you control of the transaction. You're the one picking the freight forwarder and giving instructions to that freight forwarder. 
that's important because you want these documents, which the freight forward is going to um, prepare and, and, and handle for you. You want those documents to, to make sure your goods end up uh, in your control at, uh, behind a fence at a port or airport so the buyer cannot get the goods. Okay, so now the green boxes are on these last two things, these footnotes. We mentioned that documentary collections and open accounts can be supported by credit insurance uh, and or standby letter of credit, so a word on those. First of all, standby letter of credit. Uh, like any letter of credit, is a, it is a promise of payment to the beneficiary by the applicant's bank or the buyer's bank uh, if specified conditions are met on the face of the document. Now, in this context, we're talking about using the standby letter of credit to support open account obligations. So you've shipped goods, you, you send an invoice to the buyer, and you expect the buyer to pay, but with the standby letter of credit from the buyer's bank, we've put a safety net um, underneath that transaction so that if the buyer does not pay that invoice in accordance with its terms, we can draw on the letter of credit and collect from the buyer's bank. So it's a, it's a plan B. Uh, we, we don't expect to draw on it and we only draw on it if the buyer fails to pay an invoice in accordance with its terms. It's very simple to use uh, for, for you as the seller, as the beneficiary of the letter of credit. It's, um, it's easier to use than a commercial letter of credit, a lot fewer moving parts. Um, you don't have to worry about presenting a lot of documents that have to comply with the LC and, and be consistent with one another. Usually you just have to present a written statement uh, certifying that the buyer has failed to meet his obligations under an invoice. You might have to attach a copy of the invoice so that the, the bank can look at the calendar and look at the due date on the invoice and say, yep, it's past due, and then the bank will have to pay you. Um, standby letters of credit can be used in this context for uh, one-off transactions. We tend to see them more, they make a little bit more sense for repeat business. So again, where you, would, uh, you might be shipping on a regular basis to a buyer and extend open account terms, but your, your high credit is going to be, you know, pick a number, $25,000, $50,000. That's how much uh, your letter of credit would, would be for in your favor, and, that, and you would want to take care that your high credit does not exceed that amount, or that it does so only uh, when you make an informed business decision. So you might say, well, the buyer needs, uh, needs to order, and uh, the high credit could be $75,000. However, we're going we're gonna to be happy with a $50,000 standby. We'll, We'll take $25,000 of open account exposure. Those are just all business decisions, credit decisions that the seller can make. Uh, a word on credit insurance. Um, credit insurance policies protect against insolvency or default of the buyer. Uh, they cover that commercial risk. They often, also, they typically also cover uh, certain uh, political and country risks, government actions that prevent payment, currency inconvertibility. Uh, embargo, things like that. These policies are available from uh, the U.S. Export-Import Bank, which is a federal agency established back in 1934. Uh, it's a great entity. Um, almost had its charter um, fail to be renewed uh, a year or two ago, and, um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding around it. But most of what Exim Bank does benefits small uh, companies, usually through these credit insurance policies that it issues short-term credit insurance policies to secure open account terms payable to exporters like you. There are also private insurers out there. There's a couple of the biggest names are Euler Hermes, Atreides, Kofas, uh, FCIA, and there are others entering the market. Uh, each of them have their own insurance policy, their own insurance products, but, uh, and the private insurers will, uh, uh, very importantly, they'll also cover domestic sales. They'll cover things that XM Bank won't. XM Bank, for example, cannot cover um, transactions that have more than 50% um, foreign content. They have, there has to be at least 50% U.S. content. XM Bank won't touch anything that involves a military product or a military buyer. So even if you sell paper towels, you can't sell them to a military buyer under an XM Bank policy. So the, the private insurers don't care about uh, those kinds of things. They, they're concerned about uh, the premium reward they're getting for the risk they're taking. Um, and again, there can be a whole long discussion about credit insurance, but this is just to hit the highlights. The important thing to understand about credit insurance is that it never covers product disputes. And that can be, that can be a problem. So a, a best practice I heard 
at the International Credit Executives Group a couple of years ago, which is a great a group that you all ought to join if you don't uh, belong to it already, was that the first call made to a buyer uh, should be a customer service call to confirm that the goods arrived in good order, uh, they are satisfactory as per the, the order, uh, and that the buyer also received the invoice, and there's no problems with the invoice. So therefore, you can say, okay, we'll expect to aim it in 30 days or 60 days or whatever in accordance with uh, the invoice terms, and if you get that in writing, then you've kind of taken this whole product dispute issue off the table right from the beginning. Um, with respect to how one gets credit insurance, I always recommend going through a specialty credit insurance broker. There's some very good ones around the Midwest. Uh, you may be able to buy this kind of insurance from your uh, business carrier who does your property and casualty and other kind of insurance, but beware, this is a, a special kind of dynamic insurance. You have to pay attention to the policy. Um, there are You need to have procedures in place in your company to make sure that you stay compliant with the policy, that you always have, uh, as I said before, uh, for your file in case you have to make a claim, you have a purchase order, you have an invoice, and you have a transport document that match each other uh, and that you have stayed within the, the restraints of the policy. You haven't overshipped in terms of dollar value. You haven't extended terms that exceed what the, the policy approves, etc. Now, these insurance companies all have their own in-house sales forces. Uh, they, do, uh, they work very hard to call on exporters and try to sell their products. And um, I, I, I admire them for that. They all do a good job. But I still think that a specialty credit insurance broker is the best way for you to go to make sure that you get the best policy for the best price for your particular needs. So, for example, any one of these, and don't need to pick on any of them, but let's say COFAS um, offers a, a, a policy uh, uh, with a, a minimum premium to it. You might have done better with an Exim Bank policy in your circumstances. So just work with a broker to, to get uh, the best combination of, um, of cover and premium for, for your circumstances. So, final thoughts on this are, you don't have to do this alone. Uh, please involve your friendly neighborhood international banker, involve your freight forwarder, um, choose your INCO terms wisely. Uh, you can, as I said, you can move all around this payment chart in, in choosing payment terms for different kinds of transactions in different circumstances, or even with the same customer, if circumstances change, you might find yourself moving uh, to a different place on the payment terms chart. Uh, success in this area depends on communication and cooperation between sales and the credit and finance team. Um, what's more, if we're dealing with documentary payment terms like letters of credit and documentary collections, uh, other people have to be on board. Your shipping department and others have to be on board. Um, to know uh, what's going to happen with those documents. Those shipping documents then do not go out with the product. We want those to go to the bank so they can be uh, processed properly vis-a-vis um, -vis the letter of credit or on a documentary collection basis. And the last word again, um, not to beat a dead horse, but learn your ENCO terms, uh, use them wisely, talk to your freight folder and others about them. Uh, they really, really are important for, um, for payments, for export regulatory compliance, uh, to avoid the risk of diversion of your goods, uh, contrary to, to export regs. Um, and in fact, when you, if you get credit insurance, uh, you also, you'll find you also have to show that you actually made an export sale, which means that uh, the choice of, of INCO terms is important there as well. So that concludes the presentation, and I guess I'll turn it back to Katie to see if we have any questions. Thanks, Paul. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, Go Song with Addison Clifton is asking if the presentation will be available. Um, Go Song, yes, it will. We'll be getting a link to this uh, webinar that is being recorded. Um, and you'll get that along with your evaluation. We do have another question from Chad Hoffman. Uh, the question is um, on the LC example where the hyphen is missing. What if a discrepancy is discovered after shipping the order and the buyer refuses to amend the LC? Um, well, it, I guess it depends on where the missing hyphen is. If the missing hyphen is in the letter of credit, uh, that, that's a, a problem. If the missing hyphen is in the documents you're presenting, then it may be possible for those documents to be, be changed. But uh, the, 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 the challenge here, the risk is uh, having to go back to the buyer and ask for an amendment. Uh, we often talk about 
letters of credit being revocable or irrevocable. Now the rules of letters of credit say that every letter of credit issued is, is considered irrevocable unless it explicitly states that it is revocable. Uh, but the way to make an irrevocable letter of credit revocable is to have to go back to the buyer for an amendment. Because now you've lost control of the transaction, right? Um, now, as I said before, the LC cannot be amended without the uh, agreement of every party involved. So, for example, um, if we have to go back and ask the buyer for an amendment, uh, the buyer could choose to say no. The buyer, if it's a one-time or first-time transaction, could say, hmm, this is an opportunity to uh, take advantage of the seller and uh, extract concessions that the seller might not otherwise be prepared to give. Like, you know, I really don't need that product anymore, but I'll take it off your hands for, you know, 50% haircut. Um, it could be, in fact, though, that the buyer even acting in good faith wants the product, but the circumstances have changed. Maybe the buyer's um, but the buyer no longer has use for the goods yeah. because his, his business has changed or, or his, his customer has canceled an order and the buyer says, you know, sorry, no hard feelings, it's just business, I just, I just can't, I don't need it anymore. Uh, I can't pay you for it. Um, so the buyer may choose to not to pay for it. Or it may be that the buyer still wants the product, but the banks involved have changed their mind. Maybe the buyer's bank has decided, you know what, this buyer, I issued this letter of credit six months ago, uh, and at that time, the buyer was in, was in good financial health. Now, not so much because of external factors. Exchange rates have changed. The economy has changed. Um, whatever conditions have changed. And now I don't think this buyer can pay me back anymore. And uh, Or I took cash collateral for 100% or 110% of this of this uh, order. You know, and, and the, the buyer is in Korea. And they've taken cash collateral in Korean won. But the Korean won has fallen uh, by 50%, as it did back in 19, uh, 10, uh, 20 years ago, 1997, in the Asian financial crisis. And the bank says, well, now I can't get enough won out of this guy anymore to, to pay for the dollars. I need to honor our obligation under the, the, the letter of credit. So therefore, I'm not, going, I'm not going to agree to the amendment to the letter of credit, even though the buyer may want it. So, so I just want to make sure everybody understands the importance of compliance with the LC and, and the importance of getting the LC structured properly uh, from the beginning, when we right. deal with a letter of credit, we're putting on a um, um, uh, kind of a, a, a straight jacket that's going to restrict our movements. So we want to have as much leeway uh, as we can get in places like um, the dates and and uh, things like that. It, the, the other details, like you know, missing an, uh, a hyphen, that's just going to require more eyes uh, on 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 the letter of credit on the document to make sure that we're not introducing the possibility of, of of such errors and discrepancies. Okay. Um, there is another question, Paul. Has there been a reduction in recent years in the use of LCs? Um, and if so, why? Um, you know, I, I, I don't see numbers. This question comes up all the time. It's been coming up, and I've been hearing this question for 30 years, 35 years. Uh, I don't know that it is, that the use is declining. Um, I think there will, there will at least till I, as long as I'm in this business, there will be a role for letters of credit. Um, there are efforts underway by some of the biggest global banks to introduce some electronic alternatives to letters of credit, but that's also been underway for like 20 years. Uh, and the thing is that, that uh, while developed countries might be able to move forward with things like this, undeveloped countries can't. Um, just to name a few names, you know, pick, Vietnam, Laos, Pakistan, where a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, clothing is produced these days. Uh, these are places with uh, maybe they have a lot, of, um, a lot of workers to employ, work is, uh, labor is cheap, and uh, rather than go electronic or use technology, they just employ, um, employ people. Uh, even the UCP rules that govern letters of credit, uh, those could have been uh, changed it to um, maybe to speed up the process. For example, it, it shouldn't take banks five business days to examine letters of credit, but but the, the whole the, the banking world can't move any faster than the slowest the slowest uh, uh, participant. So, you know, banks in India and, and Pakistan and elsewhere said, no, 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 we need five days because we actually physically move documents from branch to headquarters. We don't image anything. We send couriers with, you know, on bikes. 
uh, they need more time. So um, for that reason, I think letters of credit will, will be around um, perhaps indefinitely, um, and there will always be some use for them. But as we, we just discussed today, uh, no, no situation necessarily requires that they be used forever with any seller and buyer. We're typically going to try to move toward the open account end of the spectrum, but, uh, there, but there's probably a time when, when letters of credit make sense in that relationship. Okay. Um, we have five minutes left, and, and if you don't mind, I want to just mention a few things. Paul, you had mentioned um, Ecoterms, and I wanted to let all the uh, participants today know that we did do a webinar last month on Ecoterms, got into it pretty in-depth, and if anyone's interested in um, getting a copy of that, they, should, they can contact me. Also, you mentioned um, XM Bank, and I know Bruce Gualb is on the, the call today. If anyone's interested in contacting him, if you you know in-depth questions regarding XM and the products and services, and um, contact me, and I can put you in touch with them. I happen to have a question for you, uh, Paul. When you mentioned you talked about the exchange rate risk, yes, is there a formula for that, or with by country, or how how do you determine what the risk is? Is that something the banker would help you with, or, or how is that done? It's well, it's tricky, of course, because exchange rates are moving daily. They move uh, constantly, minute by minute, second by second. Exchange rates move as much or more than than uh, the stock market moves. So, you, 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 just to give you some idea, but it's it's really very hard to predict what exchange rates are going to do, because any event on any day, any pronouncement, any press conference, any tweet, any news about the Fed or who uh, this, the administration might choose to replace Janet Yellen as the next Fed chairman, all those things affect um, affect expectations about monetary policy and uh, and exchange rates. So, for example, uh, yesterday the dollar strengthened on news that a guy named Taylor might be uh, Mr. Trump's uh, pick to head uh, to replace Janet Yellen. He is seen as an inflation hawk. That suggests that he would. Uh, Fed under him would be more likely to raise interest rates maybe faster or higher than than uh, was would have been the case under Yellen if she continued and um, and higher rates mean uh, draw money into the dollar because you can earn more on investments and so the dollar strengthened on that news so today it's probably something else and it may go in the other direction so right. one one does have to one does have to talk to to a banker about this uh, what I meant to suggest is you you can't avoid uh, exposure to foreign exchange rate risk by only doing business in U.S. dollars. Um, over the past couple of years, the dollar strengthened. That made it much harder for U.S. exporters to do business overseas, uh, and, and um, they would have had to find other ways to, to cut costs by you know, making their manufacturing processes more um, um, efficient or by finding cheaper sources of, of inputs, things like that. Um, but exchange rates are just arithmetic. Uh, Regardless of what currency you're paying in or getting paid in, uh, the exchange rate is uh, is just is just arithmetic. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. Whether you're paying Canadian, uh, uh, selling in Canadian dollars or in U.S. dollars to Canada, uh, it costs the Canadian customer the same. Okay. Um, if we don't have, I don't think we have any more questions. I want to just let everyone know that this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, all of our participants. I will be sending a link to everyone, which will include uh, Paul's contact information along with a brief evaluation. Please note that all WTA members will receive a link to the WTA webinar library to access today's webinar as well as all of our past ones. Thank you, everybody.